This is for whoever falls asleep in the service today. All right, so I'm watching you guys, watching you guys. No, I wouldn't use that. Um, I'd find something harder. While I just sort out a few, uh, where is it? Okay, they've hidden my Bible. They like to do this to me. Okay, it's good to see you guys this morning. How are we doing? We doing okay? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Easter coming up, looking forward to that. Uh, while uh, Kyle was giving you guys uh, service times and stuff, so uh, really excited. This will be the first year we do two services on Easter morning uh, because we just want you to bring uh, your friends. And um, I've picked a message that, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to do. And uh, Good Friday, I don't know if those of you, who was here last year for Good Friday? Is that some of us here? So... Uh, there's a bit of a tearjerker for Good Friday. I'm obviously not going to cry, but uh, there was a, we had a very powerful uh, display on Good Friday, and we're, we're bringing that back this year for Good Friday. So if you remember what that is, then uh, invite a friend to it. So, okay, I, w- I want to get into more about the cross here because I've got <clears throat> quite a lot to talk with you guys about today. And just in preparing this message, um, I had some really, really cool revelation. Uh, And so I've got some things that I had never thought about before. And I hope that, you know, you've never thought about it either, but it really helped kind of bring some things home for me. Um, And so I'm I'm excited for it, really excited for it. So we've been talking about the cross. We spoke about the cross from the skeptic. We spoke about the power of the cross last week. A lot of great feedback from that. So very, you know, thankful for that. Uh, it seems like this stuff is really doing something for your lives. And so, I mean, that's good. That's why I do this up here. Um, today, I want to talk about something that's really significant about the cross. And that is the turning point that is the cross. So did you know that in the Bible, I used to think about this when I was, a, when I was little, when I was a kid. I used to think, okay, if Jesus were to come back, or I were to get in a car wreck, or I were to be, you know, taking my final breath, and I have not yet given my life to Christ, in that moment, I would just quickly do it, right? I don't know if anyone's had that thought. Like, uh, on my dying breath, I would just, like, Jesus, come into my heart, uh, take my life, and uh, secure my place in heaven. And that actually happens in the Bible, but there's only one story of that happening. Only one across all of the Bible. And so what that tells me is this is something that is, it's, it's very possible, but it's not probable. Because there's only one time that that's happened in all of the Bible. It's not that it's happened a lot of times, it's happened once. So if you're one of those people that's waiting, and you say, okay, I've got time, I'll make this decision later, I'll deal with this later. I, I hope that today is an encouragement that don't wait until later, do it today. In fact, uh, getting ahead of myself a little bit, um, because I'm afraid that I'll forget it later. Today is is, is a word, is God's word. Tomorrow is not God's word. See, I I think the enemy would love for you to think tomorrow, 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 whereas God is saying today, 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 today. And when I think about the opportunity that we're going to have this morning in the service, the thing that comes to mind is in that moment of today from Jesus, I want you to filter what I'm going to say today through the, the voice and the heart of Christ. This is such a gentle What I want to talk with you about today is gentle, it's loving, it's kind, Uh, it's not harsh, it's not uh, condemning, it's convicting, but conviction brings you to God rather than taking you away from God. And so this is a gentle reminder of God's love for you. It's gentle, but it's straightforward and it's powerful. So first what I want to do is I want to read for you the story, the, the, the one deathbed conversion that we find in the Bible. So they're going to put it up on the screen for you guys so that you can read uh, along with me. And it's in Luke 23, and we start in uh, verse 39. And it's, okay, it's up there for you guys on the sides. Fantastic. You can leave it on the screen here too, tech guys, if you want to. Uh, and it starts with verse 39. One of the criminals who was suspended kept up with, with a railing at him. So he's mocking Christ, saying, Are you not the Christ, the Messiah? 
rescue yourself and rescue us from death. But then the other one reproved him. He rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you yourself are under the same sentence of condemnation and suffering the same penalty? And we indeed suffer it justly receiving the due reward of our actions. So he's saying, wait a minute, Jesus doesn't deserve this, but we, we do. So then he goes on in verse 42, and he says, uh, Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingly glory. And then Jesus answered him and said, Truly I tell you, today, there's that word, today, not tomorrow, but today. Jesus said to him, I will remember you as you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, I assure you, most solemnly say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so that's the story of the one and only deathbed conversion that we see. Man on the cross at the last uh, of his moments, the, the final hope that he had, his final opportunity at his death, he looked at Jesus and said, remember me today in heaven. Now, the road to the crucifixion was not an easy road. It was not an easy road at all. The Romans brought this in. They brought this in um, from other empires, and the Romans really mastered crucifixion. They loved uh, the efficiency and the effectiveness of it. The whole point of crucifixion was to inflict the most amount of pain over the longest period of time and to make one of the greatest examples, to make an extreme example to people that, hey, this is your punishment, and it was used as a deterrent. In fact, in Jesus' time, there was actually a rebellion. And the Romans decided to squash that rebellion, and they crucified almost 3,000 people in this rebellion. So what we know about uh, the crucifixion, you know, we, we think it centers around just three people, you know, on a hillside. But actually, it, it's quite a few people. This is not a historically accurate photo. The photos that we're going to use today are inspired, are there to just inspire an, an emotion to you, to bring emotion to what it is that I'm saying. But the road to the cross was a hard road. And it was a, a, a specifically designed road to really inflict a lot of pain on people. Now, Jesus took this road to the cross. You know, it started with Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. He came down on earth. He gave everything for us. He gave his life for us. He forgave us of, of our sins. He healed people. He did miracles. He did everything from turning water to wine to raising Lazarus from the tomb. This was a good, good man. He taught people good things. Last night I was reading uh, Benjamin, one of his like kids' Bibles. And for those of you who don't know, Benjamin's are almost five-year-olds this tall. And Benjamin uh, was reading the, the, one of the stories from his little kid's Bible, and it was about the Beatitudes. It was all the, the good wisdom and good things that Jesus was saying and giving. Jesus was a good man. And in Jesus being a good man, he was betrayed by his own people, by the Jewish people. He was, uh, uh, they manipulated the Roman system. See, crucifixion was not a Jewish punishment. Crucifixion was specifically a Roman punishment. It wasn't the Jews that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was the Romans that nailed Jesus to the cross. But it took the Jews to convince the Romans to apply this punishment to Jesus where it never should have been applied to Jesus because Jesus was not a Roman. And so Jesus is taken, he's taken captive, and he's brought into the lower room, the inner dungeon, and he's, he's beaten, and he's, he's scourged with a whip that has pieces of glass and other things on the end of it. And it's designed to just open up the, the, the flesh of the back. And, and that alone would oftentimes kill people. But Jesus, he lived through this. He was beaten, he was mocked. He had the, the hair on his beard pulled out of his face, making his face bleed. He had a thorn of, of crowns or a crown of thorns put around his head. You know, Jesus endured a lot just in the beating. But then it didn't stop there. See, this Christ, this Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, the Son of God, he then left that dungeon, he left that room, he left the inner punishment room, the, the, the whippings and the beatings, and he'd had his clothes stripped off of him. And he was put, uh, he had the beam of the cross put on his back. 
And when he left, he walked out, and the two criminals that were with him on the cross, on either side of the cross, walked out with him. And Jesus was marched down the road. And as he went up to that hill that we know of today as the hill of Calvary, as he walked there, based on his blood loss and the weakness of all the beatings that he had endured, he just could not carry that beam. And as in that moment, I can only imagine the angels in heaven looking down at our Lord and Savior, the Son of God, that they knew as the Son of God, without doubt, without question. They wanted to come down and they wanted to rescue Jesus. But Jesus was saying, no, 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 not my will, but yours be done, God. Jesus, he couldn't bear the weight of that beam. He fell down. The Romans pulled a man named Simon. Simon came from a place uh, in northern Africa. Simon was a black man. You know, what's special about this here is the cross belongs to the black man. It belongs to the yellow man. It belongs to the white man. It belongs to the colored man and woman. When I say man, I also mean woman and child. The cross belongs to all of us. This is not just for a certain set of people. And I think in this, in this moment, this brutal moment where this man comes in and he helps Jesus. He helps him carry this beam. We see that God's love for all nations is displayed Right there, all people, all nations. And this man helped Jesus, and they carried this beam. They carried it up to the hill of Calvary. And when they got up to that hill, Jesus was laid down. That beam was laid down, attached to the the vertical member there of the cross. And he was nailed to that. And then he was raised up in the air. And in that moment, Jesus hung there on the cross. This is our Lord and Savior. This is the, the, the Son of God that's hanging there. I like to think, and I, and I know that this isn't necessarily documented, but I like to think that in this moment, all of heaven took a breath and held their breath. And they just watched their God, the Son of God. They watched their Jesus hang on that cross, and they could do nothing about it. And so they just watched. They watched this man give everything and stay there. In fact, while he was hanging there, he had the soldiers and he had people at the foot of the cross. And he had them, they were standing there and they were saying to him, Come on, son of God, come on, king of the Jews, pull yourself down from that cross. Come on, pull yourself down. And even at the time, the two criminals that were standing on the side... They were rebuking and yelling at Jesus. If you're the son of God, if you're the Messiah, if you're the king of the Jews, pull yourself down, call your angels to come take you down. I like to think that the angels were twitching. They were saying, we're there, Jesus. Just I dare you, Christ, snap your fingers and I will come and we will take you off that cross. In fact, if anyone else had been given that opportunity, if they had the power and the ability to pull themselves off the cross in that moment, especially knowing the way that the Romans engineered the crucifixion, then they would have have immediately pulled themselves off that cross. But not Jesus, not your Lord and your Savior, not the Son of God. He stayed. And as he stayed there, he prayed this prayer. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they were doing. Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. Now when he did this, something incredibly significant happened for us. And in the the significance of this, it's because of the cross that you absolutely cannot be saved apart from the cross. See, what the cross represents in us, the cross represents a, a, a center point in a divide. See... On one side of the cross, there is heaven, and there is glory, and there are the angels, and there is God, the Father, and and there is Jesus' throne that he came down from. But on the other side of the cross is is hell on earth. And and it's not a great term to use. I'm not saying the earth is a miserable place. Hey, I, I live in joy here on this earth. Even on my worst days, I can claim joy. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that there is a separation. On one side of the cross is God, and the other side of the cross is this earth that we live on, this earth that we live in, the sinful nature of man. That's what I mean by hell on earth. And guess which side humanity has chosen? They've chosen hell on earth. They've chosen sin. 
Now, there is absolutely no way that we can come to God without going through the cross. That was the significance. As Jesus could have pulled himself down, he stayed up there. And the reason that he stayed up there is because he knew that upon the completion of his death, he would be able to bridge the gap between us and God. The cross is the proof and evidence of our salvation. Nothing else proves and and edifies that moment in our life where we're able to say that I am forgiven. And because of the cross, we are able to pass from where we are in our sinful nature. And we are able to go through and we were able to experience God. To be in relationship with God and encounter with God. Now I know that up to this point, this this has been a, a, a little bit like, it's been dramatic, it's been heavy. But this part is not a heavy part. This part is a part that we, glor- that, that we, just, uh, we, we, we glorify God in, but we thank God for it. This is joyous. I am so thankful that there is a bridge between me and God. See, before Christ died on the cross, I was a sinful person, or I, I'm still a sinful person. But because of what he did on the cross, I've got forgiveness for my sins. And in the forgiveness of my sins, I've got freedom. There's not a moment in my life where I have to worry about my salvation because I know that me and God, I, I'm his child. I'm his son. I, my spot in heaven is secure. That's joyful. And here's why I claim that. In Ephesians 2.8, Paul talks about this as he writes to the church of Ephesus. And he says, For it is by grace... It's not by your pride, it's not by your money, it's not by your giftings, it's not by how cool you are, it's not by how great you are, it's not by how many people that you have that look up to you, it's not by what you've accomplished in life, it's not about the money that you give to charity, it's not about how good you are, it's not about how much money you give out at robots to people that help it. You could, do, you could solve world hunger and if you don't have Christ in your life, if you've not accepted Christ, if you've not traveled through the cross, through grace, then there is no way... Still, that you were going to enter into the presence of God. Because Paul says, For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor, drawing you to the cross. And that grace that draws you to the cross, you have been saved, which means actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. That faith is me saying, Lord, you are my Lord and Savior. God, I won't get it right. I'm a sinful person. I'm a mess. But you're my Savior. And I do give you my life. And in doing that, I travel through the cross into that grace. Grace is being given something you don't deserve. Mercy is being spared a punishment that you do deserve. And the cross gives us grace and mercy. If we go through this here, if we keep going, and this salvation is not of yourself. That means you can't earn it. And praise the Lord for that, because you know what? If we could earn salvation, then here's what would happen. You would have such a cultural divide. You would have those that can earn salvation. You would have those that are trying to earn salvation. You have those that absolutely can't earn salvation. Because we as a, as a society love to qualify ourselves, and we especially love to qualify ourselves as right over others. And as we were to qualify ourselves, we would say, here's all the things you need to do to move up in in the the chain here and become somebody that does deserve salvation. But when Jesus died on the cross, he leveled all that out. It does not matter who you are, where you come from, your background, how rich or poor you are. It doesn't matter your ability, how good you are, how kind you are. It doesn't matter how strong your conscience is. It does not matter. You have nothing in your body, nothing in your personality, nothing in your character trait, not a single thing about you that makes you deserve salvation or allows you to travel through the cross into the presence of God except the grace of God. And through faith, if you carry that grace, if you walk around in it, and this is a good thing, if you've never given your life to Jesus, man, you're missing out. Because if you give your life to Jesus, you can wake up every morning and say, I may be a mess today, but I'm a mess today that's owned and, and bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. And I don't have to worry about a single thing in my life. Now, if you don't want that, then, I, I, then I, I'm just going to keep shouting. I'm going to keep talking about it until one day you decide, you know what? I do think that I want that. I, I just can't imagine living life without Jesus. I can't imagine it. So anyway... As we go through this here, it says, not by your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious 
gift of God. And then in verse 9, Paul goes on to say, Not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. Oh, man, that is so powerful. What this verse explains to me is it explains to me something so gentle and loving and kind that this man hung on the cross and endured the cross for me so that I don't have to earn or deserve it. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is accept grace, is just accept that. It's, it's like if you were drowning and you don't know how to swim, our pool at home, a very interesting pool. I mean, I, I enjoy it. I like it a lot. Uh, it's big. And it's got three steps that go down. And you know how a pool normally has like a gradual, you know, a shallow end. It goes down to a deep end, you know, at the bottom. Well, ours has got one step ankle deep, another step knee deep, another step waist deep. And then when you step off that step, it's just drowning. Like there's no, there's no in between there at all. You're just immediately like up to your nose in water. Uh, if, you're my, if you're my height, maybe you tall people are fine, but shorter people, uh, when we fill the pool, when it's evaporated and we fill it up, uh, my wife has trouble standing in the pool, like you're on your tippy toes. Um, if you were drowning, if you couldn't swim and you fell into that pool, I live in constant fear that our kids will do that. We Don't worry, we have a gate. We keep it closed and locked. But just imagine if you're drowning and... You're throwing your arm out and Jesus is there and he's got an arm and he's even got a stretchy arm and it stretches all the way down to you. And he says, here you go, just hold on. And you were to say, nope, I can do it on my own. And he's like, are you sure? Because you're drowning. And you're like, nope, I can do it. You're gasping for air. You're breathing in water. He's like, nope, I can do it. Jesus, don't need your arm. So then Jesus' little magic stretchy arm, it actually wraps around you. And then you're fighting it so much. Can you imagine like just biting his arm to get it off of you? I mean, the pursuit of Jesus is to save you. That's it. The pursuit of Jesus is not to condemn you. It's not to hurt you. It's not to tell you how bad of a person you are. It's not to make you feel guilty in the mornings or at night when you wake up or you go to bed. The pursuit of Christ is simply to save you. That's why I died on the cross. He doesn't want you to drown. And when he puts his arm around you to bring you to the cross. Don't bite the arm. Don't bite the hand. It's just there to pick you up out of the water and save you. There's such a powerful example of this, that it is grace and grace alone that earns our place in heaven. We see this example in the two thieves. And these two thieves that hung on the cross next to Jesus in the Bible, it calls them thieves, but if you look at the Greek, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the text, the words that were used here, it's not just someone that's stealing candy out of a candy shop. This is somebody, or these are people that were, were thieves, they were, they were robbers, but they were robbers with the intent to harm. And so maybe they murdered people, maybe they didn't. They were called thieves. Some translations say uh, thieves and murderers. But these, these were more than just people that stole. These were bad people. The same words that are used to describe these thieves are also used to describe bandits and revolutionaries and murderers. And so these people that were hanging next to Jesus, they did deserve, based on Roman law, they deserved to be there. They were convicted. There's a man named Barnabas, and Barnabas was also supposed to be put on the cross. And as Pilate was trying to figure out, let me try and pardon Jesus and keep him from being put there. And Barnabas was voted by the people to be set free, but Barnabas, by Roman law, deserved to be there. Jesus, by Roman law, did not deserve to be there. But for our sake, he had to be there. Now, this same word that describes these thieves is also used uh, to describe Barnabas, which again just reinforces these were not kind people. These were not good people. These were not petty thieves. These were revolutionaries. These were murderers. These were people that had intent and did intend to hurt people. So those two thieves are hanging next to Christ. And while Jesus is hanging there, they're they're mocking him, saying, Come on, Jesus, why do you stand there on the cross? Why do you hang there on the cross? Come off that cross. And they're actually yelling at him. And I, I can almost imagine it's like an insult to them that he could come down, but he doesn't come down. 
he decides to stay. And they, they're saying, well, if you could come down, why are you not coming down? See, what Jesus did for us on the cross doesn't make sense in our human mind. And it absolutely will never make sense, and it can't make sense. Because what you endure on the cross, everyone has a breaking point. Every single person. And that breaking point is like a, it, it's a breaking point of, of pain. And you know, that, that's, why, uh, uh, that's why torture exists. That's why TV shows um, have this in it, you know, uh, where they like to kind of exploit this in the interrogation room. That's, that's why this exists, because everyone has a breaking point. But Jesus did not have this breaking point. Maybe the thieves on the sides of Jesus thought, well, if he takes himself down, it'll create such a ruckus or something will happen, and maybe then we'll get to come down. But that, obviously, as we know, doesn't happen. And then in that moment, one of the thieves, his name was Dismas, D-Y-S-M-I-S or D-I-S-M-I-S, he takes an opportunity as he's watching his life and feeling his life slip away. He takes this opportunity he looks at Jesus. And he says, you know what, this, maybe internally he says, this may be my one shot. But something different happens in his heart. Maybe he starts to look, what's going to happen after this death, this impending death? Now remember, the deathbed conversion is not something that's common. Because right there... You've got the two thieves. I would like to think that if one thief decides to speak kindly to Jesus, the other thief would say, you know what, let me try that. You know, because this is going to end no matter what. So let me at least just try that pathway. But he doesn't. He continues to mock and rebuke Jesus. But the one thief, Dismas, he looks at Jesus. And what ends up happening in his life is he starts to transition from ridicule to repentance. And in this repentance the repentance of his heart, you know, he, he rebukes the one thief that's mocking Jesus. And he says, how dare you mock this man because he doesn't deserve to be here. He knew that maybe Jesus was uh, Jewish and he wasn't Roman and he shouldn't be put there on the cross. But he's, he's mocking Jesus and he says, hey, stop mocking this man. We deserve to be here, but this man doesn't deserve to be here. Now, I like to ask the question, what's happening in his heart? Why the heart change? Maybe the anger of him being on, on a cross starts to settle down as he starts to accept his reality and then look forward into his future and say, what's going to happen after this? And in that moment, he starts to have more of a, maybe a kingdom mindset. And that's when in verse 42, we'll read this again. He looks at Jesus and he was saying, Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, his repentance is not complicated. His repentance is, is, is not overwhelming. It's not a long prayer. It, it, it's not, uh, you know, asking for forgiveness of his sins. It, it's not saying, uh, hey, repeat after me. He didn't have to bring in a pastor and say, repeat this after me and give his heart to Jesus. And they didn't have to, like, throw buckets of water up on him so that he was, like, technically baptized, you know, in order to go into heaven. No, he just says these, these simple words says, Jesus, remember me. Now this man, he showed something that we don't give him credit for. Imagine the spectacular th uh, faith of the thief on the cross. Imagine this. See, Jesus had been doing miracles his whole life. He had been, he had been uh, raising people from the dead like Lazarus. He's, he's, been doing, he's been healing the blind. He's been forgiving people of their sins. He's been standing up to the Pharisees. Jesus had stood in front of crowds of 3,000 and above, and he had fed them with a couple fish and a couple of loaves. The whole life of Jesus is covered in miracles. And in the life of Jesus, the man on the cross, the thief on the cross, he, that's not when he asked for repentance. That's not when he says, remember me in paradise. This man had faith in Jesus for his salvation when Jesus was at his absolute lowest. The moment that Jesus refused to display his power as Christ, this man put his faith in him. With blood matted in Jesus' hair from the thorn of crowns, with, with the, the openings of his skin through the scourging, while well, he hung there and asked God, forgive them for they know not what they were doing in his meekness, in his humility, in his embarrassment, in his shame, the man next to Jesus said, remember me. 
And he put his faith in the weakest, by human standards, in the weakest version and form of Christ. It wasn't when Jesus walked on water. It wasn't when uh, Jesus walked through the crowds. Uh, at, at, there was a story where, or an, an event where Jesus was about to be uh, murdered by a crowd of people. A bunch of people were mad at him. And that dude just turned like invisible and he just walked through everybody. It, that's not when it happened. See, the spectacular faith of the thief of the cross is something that I think we can draw inspiration from. Because in Jesus' weakest moment is when this man put his faith in Christ. See, it's easy to look at this guy and say, all he said was, remember me. And this dude got to go to heaven? Not fair. But it wasn't just that. There was faith behind it. Ephesians says, Ephesians tells us, like we read, that you are saved by grace, and that grace comes through putting your faith in Jesus. And this man put his faith in Jesus, at Jesus' weakest. See, it was a small, tiny, short prayer of repentance. Tiny. We like to overcomplicate this thing. We like to say that, man, my salvation, I've got to get my life right. I've got to get everything okay. I've got to put on the right clothes. I've got to clean myself up. I've got to deal with my problems, my addictions. I've got to deal with my shortcomings. I've got to deal with my anger. My life's a little bit of a mess right now. I don't even fully understand this thing. Do you think the thief on the cross understood anything about Christ and salvation? Do you think that he was wearing a suit? Do you think that he was dressed well? Do you think that his life was together? No, this man was condemned rightly by Roman law to die in the worst possible way. He is the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. And right there, as he was, as he stood, he prayed the simplest prayer of repentance that there is to pray. And it was, will you remember me? Will you remember me? You see, the power in this is in what Jesus did. This man, he put his faith in Christ. You can put your faith in Jesus. You can. Wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with. You can put your faith in Jesus. As weak as you are, you can put your faith in Christ. As much as you don't have life together, you can put your faith in Christ. You know what? You're not the man hanging on the cross next to Jesus. You're not that person. So we're doing a whole lot better than him. Show me the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst of, this, of people in this room and outside of this room. And I'm here to tell you that you can put your faith in Jesus. And this all happens. This all is made possible. See, we just have to have the faith part. We don't have to do the work. We just have to believe. We just have to accept the grace and do our part for faith. But that's not the work. See, the work that was done for this to happen, for this to be made possible for your life. And remember, this, this is tender. This is gentle. But yet, this is extremely powerful. See, as Jesus hung there on the cross, Jesus, he actually did not take on your sin. Jesus, instead, he became sin. And see, as the angels in heaven, as God in heaven, as everyone held their heavenly breath and watched Jesus... He experienced separation from God because not only did he take, he, he didn't take on sin, he became sin. Every sin that had ever been committed, he became it. Every sin that ever would be committed, he became it. Think about your own personal life. All right, think about, let's talk about the easy sins, that little fib you told, that little lie. You know, maybe the little bit of gossip that you said, you know, behind somebody's back. That post you made on Facebook, the little bit of money that you kept, you know, you checked out to register and someone gave you five rand over. You thought, oh, you know, gift for me. Jesus became that sin. You know, that lie that our five-year-old Benjamin tells when he doesn't get what he wants and he lies to me because mom has told him no and he comes in and he says, you know, dad, I'm um, thinking about something. This is new. This is something new that he does right now. So he'll ask for something and Mom will say no. And he'll come to me and he'll say, you know, Dad, I'm, I, I've been thinking about something lately. You think he's going to say something like deep, but it's not. And I, and I say, what is it that you're thinking about, son? And he says, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, um, 
I'm thinking about watching JJ a little bit. That's what I've been thinking about. JJ is the iPad, and we call it JJ because of that uh, horrible show on, um, somebody tell me what it's called, Coco Melon. Yeah, anyone else, Coco Melon ruin your life, you know? So Coco Melon, which is just printing money like crazy, uh, Coco Melon's got a character called JJ. Benjamin used to watch JJ a lot, and so Benjamin will say, I'm thinking about watching JJ. You know, that, I mean, the, the little kid, is, he's sinning. Yeah, it's a sin because he's telling a lie. That little lie, Jesus became that little lie. But now I want you to think about, like, okay, let me just get a little bit real with you for a second. Think about, I don't want you to carry this or be condemned by it, but think about that, that nasty sin in your life. Because we've all got it. Nobody's immune to it. That, that one that's really shameful. You know, there's some sins that, that you'd be able to say, like, you know what, I deal with this, and, and this is my problem, and share it with people. Hey, I hope this encourages you. But there's something in your life that you think, if this got out, if people knew this about me, I would not be able to show my face in public. This would be shameful. This would just be too much for me to know that other people know. That little secret that you have that you've got buried in the privacy of your home or the privacy of your office or the privacy of your heart, that little secret, that little kind of dirty thing, Jesus became that. He hung on the cross and he became that. He became that sin for you. So he became all of our sin. And as he became all of our sin, he was separated from God. It was God had to turn away from Jesus. And Jesus, he felt the weight. You know how bad you feel when you get caught in a sin or a lie? or an infidelity, or whatever it is. You know, bad that like, oh, I feel so bad that I got caught. Some of us feel bad that we did it. Most of us feel bad that we got caught. But that, that feeling in the, the pit of your stomach. Okay, so imagine that, but the weight of the world. And Jesus experienced separation from God in that moment. He became your sin. But guess what? The good news is, is that Jesus became sin for all, for joy. It wasn't he became sin for all because that was just a hard thing that he had to do. He became your sin because of joy. Because Jesus knew that when he became your sin, that means that on this day in March, you would be sitting here in this auditorium and there was joy in Christ dying for your sin because he knew that today there may be somebody that will say, I want this Jesus in my life today. And that brought Jesus joy. There is joy in Jesus knowing that he connected the dots and he made a way for us to have an encounter with Christ. Jesus did this for joy. The joy of our salvation, the joy of giving grace, the joy of giving mercy. The Son of God hung on the cross with joy. That's crazy. He endured separation from God with joy for you. When I gave my life to Jesus, there was a party in heaven, and I like to think that Jesus looked down and he said, that's why I did it, and I'm happy that I did, because now that son of mine, his eternity is secure with me. Now, because of this joy, as Jesus gave his life, as he gave his life up and he died there on the cross, I'd like to think about who do you think the first person to join Jesus in paradise was? Who, who was that person? Who, who, was, who was the first to join Jesus in paradise? You know, maybe it was Moses because Moses is amazing. Maybe it was Abraham because Abraham was like who we promised the nation of Israel would come from. Maybe it was Peter, Paul, you know, Matthew, John, you know, whoever. Insert this here. And again, this is, this is speculation. But I I like to think that maybe the first person that joined Jesus in paradise was the thief on the cross next to him. Can you imagine that? So this thief is hanging on the cross next to Jesus. He dies. All right. And Jesus had said, you will join me in paradise today. Not tomorrow, not in a thousand years, but today. So this man shows up to the pearly gates. And I'm again, I'm going to speculate here. Uh, don't, Don't go pull Bible verses and email me Bible verses on this. But just speculating. The man shows up to the pearly white gates. There's an angel there. The angel says, hello, nice to see you. The man says, where am I at? What is this? The angel says, well, you're at the gates of heaven. 
God says, uh, is heaven the same thing as paradise? Okay, yeah, it's paradise. Okay, I'm where I need to be. Then the angel looks at him and says, okay. Pulls out his book, you know, questionnaires, forms for everything. And he says, okay, uh, date of salvation. And the guy says, uh, I don't really know, maybe, maybe today. Uh, okay, God says, uh, when were you baptized? He says, what's baptism? All right, angel says, um, okay, can't answer that question. Are you post-trib, pre-trib, you know? <laughs> you know? Come on, laugh about that, guys. Uh, God says, uh, I don't understand. I don't know what that is either. Angel says, okay, are you reformed? The guy, reformed from what? You know? Angel says, uh, have you spoken in tongues yet? The guy says, I don't think so. I yelled a lot. You know, I was hanging on a cross. That was painful. Yelled a whole bunch. Angel asks him a couple more questions. God's got no answers for any of this. Angel says, why are you here? Why? See, we would say, why on earth are you here? He goes, why in heaven are you here? Now, the man, the thief, he says something so profound. He says, the man in the middle invited me. The man in the middle told me I could come. And see, what that shows me is that shows me that there is a grace that we will never understand. And you know what? I don't want to understand that grace. I don't, I don't want to understand it. Because if I can understand it, it, it just takes away from the specialness of it. But we cannot understand the grace of God. Because here we put so many qualifications on things. But in heaven, in Jesus, and what Jesus did is he took a man that had no history with baptism or salvation. He, did, he couldn't quote a verse from the Old Testament. He couldn't do anything. He didn't, probably didn't even know what these words meant. He didn't have any. This man never uh, uh, did, maybe never did a good thing in his life. We don't know. But this man was sentenced to death on the cross, and on his deathbed, he asked Jesus, Will you remember me? And Jesus chose. He, ne- he doesn't tell another person in the Bible this. He chose, and he said, I will see you today. Imagine that grace. That grace is immediate. And the grace that Jesus offers is immediate. It wasn't, I will see you today, as long as you're able to pull yourself off the cross and get baptized. You also got to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, so you need to be looking for fire from heaven. It's going to land on your tongue. It's going to do stuff, but don't worry. It doesn't burn your mouth. It's fine. He didn't say any of that stuff. He just said, I'm going to remember you today. And this thief, he ends up in heaven. just, the man in the middle invited me here. Guys, this is... This is the same grace that's extended to you today. This is, this is it. This is the turning point of the cross. That man that hung next to Jesus experienced the turning point in his life and his eternity for the cross. I would love for you to experience the turning point of the cross in your life. Maybe everybody in here has experienced that. If that's true, then I'm just going to be honest with you right now. Uh, next week, I want to see this crowd doubled because I want everybody to go find somebody that hasn't experienced the turning point of the cross. Because if what we're talking about is good and it's good news, if it's good enough for a thief hanging on a cross next to Jesus, it's probably good enough for your neighbor or good enough for the person that you work with. Just get them in the building and let's trust God to do the work in their life. We can't dare say this is good news and then hide it and not talk about it. What are we doing with that? You know, we could be rescued from drowning, but we don't want to come outside the pool and look at the guy that's in the water and say, man, I really hope that uh, Jesus moves in your life. I pray that God will move in your life right now. Jesus is saying, well, reach down and grab the guy. We can do that. So what I want to pray today, based on this, grace is immediate. I want to pray the thief's prayer of repentance. This is, this is what I want for us today. And I've put this up. It's going to come up on the screens for you here. And th- this here is, um, I want to make this easy for you. I want to make this really easy for you. Uh, Bradley, you can turn the pad down just a little bit, just so everybody can hear me well. Thanks, guys. If you want to experience the grace given to you from the cross, this is for you. This is, this is for you. If you want to be the thief that says, remember me today. If you've never said, Jesus, remember me today in paradise. 
If you've never said, Jesus is in this room right now, and he is saying, cool, you pray this prayer, you do this, you repent, because it's really, there's no magic in the words here, it's just repentance. If you repent in your heart and you put your faith in Christ, Jesus will say, cool, you're done today. Grace is today. Grace is immediate today. And so I, I'm going to pray this prayer. And, and you know what? If you want to bow your heads, close your eyes, you can bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm not going to ask you to repeat after me. I'm just going to pray it slowly. And if you want this, then this is your opportunity to just look up here at the screen. That's why I have it everywhere. So you can't miss it. Because I want you to be able, well, even if it's just a, a, a peak of an eye, I want you to, to look at it and say it in your heart. So let's do this. Bow your heads, close your eyes, or keep them open, and look up. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to, to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. This is between you and Jesus right now. Lord, I am a sinner. I have broken your law. I know I am, and I am willing to change my whole direction of life. I want you to come in as my Lord and my Master and my Savior. Today I ask you, will you remember me in your kingdom? Thank you that your promise is that I will join you today.